Hi, my name is Dave Collegian. I'm the youth director here at Bridges Community Church, and we are so glad you're joining us. Whether you're online or in person, we're glad you're here. Worship time will begin soon, but before we do, we just want to let you know a few things that are going on here at Bridges Community Church. Family Fun Night is just two weeks away. On October 29th at 5.30, we will be hosting our community at a drive through Trick Car Treat event, and we need your help. Please bring candy. We need lots and lots of candy to host this event. We also need you to sign up and decorate and host a, your car during the Trick or Treat event. And we also have these great postcards for you to hand out to your neighbors and your friends, inviting them to come to our event. I hope to see you on Friday, October 29th, right here on our campus. November 19th and the 20th. What is happening on November 19th and the 20th? That is our Feed My Starving Children mobile pack event here at Bridges Community Church, and you need to sign up. It is so much fun, where we pack food that is then used by Feed My Starving Children, which is a wonderful international ministry, and they take the food that we pack and they spread it around to children and families around the world, particularly in malnourished countries. These are shifts that you will be signing up for, and you can sign up to serve at Feed My Starving Children at, by going to bridges.info to the service opportunities page. That's bridges.info. Go to the service opportunities page and it will tell you all about the event on no November 19th and the 20th. Feed My Starving Children. Sign up for your shift, your family, you're a single individual. Kids can participate as well. We'd love to have you. Go to bridges.info and sign up today for Feed My Starving Children event on November 19th and 20th.
Well, hey, everybody, I've got uh, my friend John Rosemley that many of you know that is uh, joining me today. And John, it's a thrill to have you and you and I were just chatting before this recording about the long legacy of faith that your family has had in connection with the church back in the old First Baptist Church of Los Altos days. And we were reminiscing about some of that. And you were sharing with me that this is your 40th year of serving with crew as far as being supported by bridges. And um, I just think that that's incredible. So we celebrate you. We celebrate Sherry, and we just wanted to touch base. So welcome. We're glad that you're a part of this. I wanted to start off by those, uh, for those who don't know you, uh, what it is that you do with Crew and what you and Sherry are up to these days. Yeah, well, it's great to be able to join everybody uh, virtually and talk to you, Steve. And so um, I'm really, I really appreciate this opportunity. Like, like you said, I've been on staff with Crew for 40 years. Right now, um, I've, I've been asked to join uh, a national staff care team. As a part of the national team, um, I'm, I'm available to help with, sometimes we have like difficult situations, crisis situations. I'm a part of that crisis team. Uh, if we have a crisis situation overseas or, or even in, in the U.S. And sometimes we just have tricky situations that, that need a little bit more experience to handle. And so I, I handle those. Um, I think the thing I'm really most excited about that I've been doing is I've, I've been coaching our missionaries that, that are heading overseas, our campus missionaries. And uh, we have a, a training curriculum that we, that we run every summer. It's, we call it X-Track. And, um, and so I, I had the privilege of being able to coach um, three of our, of our outbound missionaries. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we love the work of crew. God uses people in all sorts of ways, but crew has had this longstanding just reputation for sending the gospel out to the nations and raising up new leaders. And we're just thrilled that you're connected with them. You know, you also had mentioned to me about, uh, in addition to some of the things you're working on, that Sherry has recently had a bit of a transition and uh, new, a new a new season of life for her. Talk about that. Yeah, we've, you know, we got married. We've just celebrated our 35-year anniversary this year. And uh, as long as we've been married, we've been on staff together. She joined staff right before we got married. Um, and yeah, but in the last, just over the last year or so, she began to sense that God was leading her to leading her away from the role that she had. She had a role, a pretty significant leadership role uh, heading up our, our human resources for the whole West coast for, for the campus ministry. And uh, she did that for eight or nine years. And it was like, it was really stretching, exciting, but as she sensed that God was maybe leading her to step away from that and to consider maybe whatever he might have for her. The, a restaurant reached out to her, the COO of which was a former, uh, a student formerly involved in crew as a student. Okay. And uh, who, had, who had known of Sherry and reached out and said, we want you to come into our corporation at the corporate level and, and head up our our people, what we call people and culture, human resources, and kind of set culture for our, for our whole company, our whole corporation. How would you ask people to be praying for you, certainly for you and for Sherry in this new season of her life and for Open Doors, but just overall, what is it that you're hoping that people would, would have in mind as they lift you up in prayer? Yeah, I, I really appreciate it if people, if as God brings us to mind, if people would pray for Sherry in her role. We're, one thing that we're really looking at really closely, a lot more now than ever before, is the area of mental health. As the stigma of mental health illness and mental health um, kind of gets wiped away a little bit more and more every, each year, I think. I think students are really beginning to express felt needs and real needs in the area of mental health, and even some of our staff. I'm part of a small group that we're trying to figure out how, what are ways that we can address that? What are ways that, that we can help people get, maybe get the help that they need? Because in a way, I think the needs that people are experiencing um, really call attention to our need, our need for a savior, our need for God's presence and touch in our lives. We will absolutely be honored to to pray about those needs as a church brother. So thank you for this update. I hope that it brings encouragement to our folks. I hope that it also 
is an opportunity for some of our newer folks or younger families to see how God is working and maybe preparing them someday to be used in some specific way. But however this works out, church family that is watching this, I want you to connect with the Brosenleys, just a beautiful family. And we, John, just celebrate you and Sherry in 40 years. That's just, <laughs> we just rejoice. And then, of course, many more in connection with the church. So thank you, brother, for your time. Thank you, Stephen. I, I, I really want to say how thankful Sherry and I are, have been and continue to be for um, just the ongoing support, partnership, prayer, and just friendship um, of Bridges Community Church. It's meant so much to us, and we are so thankful um, for, for each of you. Romans 15, verses 5 to 7. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. If you, uh, if you haven't been here the last several weeks, um, as a church, we've been studying how to deepen our relationships with one another, which, let's face it, given the last year and a half, seems especially relevant uh, right now, um, because it's been tough, right? Uh, we've been limited in how much we can interact with others. Some of our relationships have been strained if we have different views of things, so it's been tough, um, and it's okay to say that it's been tough. Um, it's been relationally difficult over the last 18 months. But even uh, pre-pandemic and pre-2020, I had this question regarding how um, individuals connect together and become community with one another. Uh, you could say it like this, all groups have people, a church has people, a family has people, your company, your team, your division, they all have people right? Every group has people, but not every group has a sense of community with each other. Why? Why is that? Why is it that in some families, when the kids grow up and the kids can choose uh, who they vacation with and who they can hang out with on a Tuesday night, why do some grown-up kids choose to hang out with their parents and their siblings um, and other grown-up kids only make the occasional mandatory phone call and complain about being together on Thanksgiving. Why is that? Why is it that some families are best friends and others aren't? In a company, why do some people feel connected to their coworkers and others feel isolated? Why do, on some sports teams, the, the people on the sports teams, why do they talk about it being a brotherhood? Um, and on other sports teams, everybody's just out for themselves, right? Every group has people. Not every group has community. And the same thing happens at church. Uh, for some people, church people are their people. The, 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 they have a sense of belonging at church. They'd say, I can't imagine my life without these people. For other people, church people are not their people, right? The church might be fine. Um, you know, you might know some people's names there. You might know a couple of facts about other people. You might even sit in a class or even serve with them sometimes, but that's about as far as it goes. You're not going to talk about um, anything personal with them because you have other people for that. The church people are okay as far as it goes, but they just aren't your inner circle. Um, you're kind of doing life adjacent to church people, not really doing life with them. So what makes the difference? How do you switch from life adjacent to life with? How do you switch from a group of people to a community? That's what we've been studying. And that's what we will, will study for the next couple of weeks and as uh, October closes. Now, Scripture gives us a whole bunch of instructions on how to do life with each other, how to get a group of people to be a community of people. Those instructions, you may remember from last week, are called the 
one another commands. Last week, we talked about greeting one another, showing appreciation for one another, being attentive and empathetic to one another. This week might be the most difficult one another for some of us because it requires something that many of us are tentative to give. Um, So before we talk about the difficult part of this one another, let's talk about the benefit. I want to sell you on it first, okay? Let's talk about the reward before we talk about the cost of the reward. Romans 15, 7, accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you. The reward is acceptance from each other to the same incredible degree that Christ accepts us. Now, some of us here today uh, don't really believe that Christ can accept us uh, because of what we've done or where we've been or what's going on in our lives. So first, we need to address how completely Christ accepts us before it'll sound like good news that other people in the church will accept us like Christ accepts us. So how does Christ accept us? Answer, unconditionally, unequivocally, unreservedly always for us, without hesitation. That's how Christ accepts us. Paul wrote, accept one another as Christ has accepted you in chapter 15 of his letter to the church in Rome. Chapter 15. So he's assuming when you read chapter 15, you're already familiar with the first 14 chapters of his letter to the church in Rome, which is obviously too much for us to unpack this morning. But just a snapshot of the big picture of how completely Christ accepts us. Romans 8.1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. How does Christ accept us? With zero amount of condemnation. You might be like, really? Zero condemnation? Yeah. Zero. Well, what if I've screwed up really badly? Isn't God waiting to like hit me with a stick as soon as I step out of line? And I'd say, I'm terribly sorry for whoever gave you that picture of God. It is not correct. For believers in Christ, for believers in Christ, for those of us who have put our trust in Jesus to free us from condemnation and judgment, the correct picture is God coming to rescue us whenever we step out of line. Not coming to hit us with a stick, coming to rescue us. Right before Paul wrote, there is now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us about his own sin. In fact, he says he can't stop sinning. He says, what a wretched man that I am. And then he asks, who will rescue me? from this body of death, Romans 7, 24. And he answers his own question. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. He's like, when I am a mess, Jesus comes to rescue me. He doesn't come to hit me with a stick. He comes to bring me closer to him. He doesn't push me away. That's why Paul says there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul continues, Romans 8, 38, neither death nor life, angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So what does acceptance in Christ look like? It's an acceptance that nothing is ever going to get in the way of it. It's unconditional. It's unequivocal. It's unreserved. It's always for us. It's without hesitation. It's an acceptance where everything is known, and yet Jesus comes toward us anyway. Everything is known, and yet he still loves us the same. And this is where we start getting nervous, because we don't really want everything about ourselves to be known. We have a fear of being exposed. We think if people really knew everything about me, they'd reject me. And we don't want to be rejected, remember? Because rejection hurts. We talked about that the first week of this series. So we conceal certain aspects of our lives in order to avoid rejection. But Jesus sees everything and still accepts us. That's what his acceptance is like. As Tim Keller says, Jesus sees us to the bottom, yet loves us to the sky. 
Jesus is not surprised by anything that happens in our lives. He knows exactly where we have been, what we have done, and what we will mess up with in the future. And he still comes toward us. Or as Matt Chandler often says, Jesus knew what he was buying when he bought you. He doesn't have buyer's remorse. He knew everything about you, and he still wanted you. He accepts the real you, not the version of you that you present to the public, because that's not the real you, is it? We, well, what we often do is conceal the parts of us that we perceive others won't really like, and we only let other people see the aspects of ourselves that we think they will accept. But that's kind of a farce, right? Because that version of us doesn't really exist. It's like a photoshopped version of us. So if they end up liking the photoshopped version, I mean, great, but it also leaves us a little hollow because instead of accepting the real us, they're only accepting that edited version of us. If we want them to accept us like Christ accepts us, then they would need to know us like Christ knows us. Remember, Christ accepts us in a way that sees us to the bottom and yet loves us to the sky. So if anyone else is going to accept us like Christ does, they will need to see us to the bottom. You get that idea there from verse 5 in Romans 15. It says, this, have the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. What is Christ's attitude of mind towards us? What is, his, what is in his mind about us? Right? His attitude is he receives all of us, and in his mind nothing is hidden. Then verse 6 says that we speak the same things to each other um, about each other, that Christ speaks to us so that we together with him will have one voice, right? So what is it that Christ speaks to us? He says that there is no condemnation for you. He says there's nothing that will separate you from my love. It's I know everything about you. I'm still coming towards you. Then in verse 7, it says, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. So the idea of these three verses is we're fully known, we're fully accepted, and we articulate that acceptance back and forth to each other through our speech, which reinforces to ourselves what Christ is saying to us, like the horizontal matches the vertical, so we're all on the same page. And that sounds great, except for the being fully known part. Hence why I said this might be the most difficult of the one another's. The biggest challenge with accept one another isn't us accepting someone else's faults, although that can sometimes be pretty difficult, right? That's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is letting other people see our faults so they can accept us. The biggest challenge is being vulnerable and transparent, letting someone else see us to the bottom. But again, if they don't see us completely, and then accept us, then they are not accepting us like Christ accepts us. So for today, we're going to talk about three aspects of our lives that we must reveal in order to give others the opportunity to accept us like Christ accepts us. There's probably more aspects of our lives that we need to reveal, probably, but we're just going to cover three big ones today. That'll be enough. So here they are. Uh, Suffering, shortcomings, and sin. Sufferings, shortcomings, and sin. So the first aspect of our lives that we need to reveal in order for people to accept us like Christ accepts us is suffering. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, I will boast about my weaknesses. He actually says he will gladly boast about his weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He says that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and weaknesses, and insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, Paul doesn't hide the suffering he's in. He shouts it from the rooftops. He boasts. He's like, hey, look at me. I'm having a hard time over here. When we are going through a hard time, do we tend to tell others about it, or do we keep it to ourselves? Do we say, ah, I can handle it. I don't want to bother other people with what's going on with me. They would get tired of me talking about this all the time. They don't need to know. I mean, when you're sick, do you let people bring you soup? Or are you like, ah, I can handle it. 
When you have a huge unforeseen expense, do you try to manage it on your own? Or do you say, I, I really need some help for, with this? Is it easy to ask for help? Or is it hard to ask for help? Doesn't seem like we'd be boasting in our weaknesses and difficulties if it's hard for us to ask for help, right? Paul says, Galatians 6, that we are required to carry one another's burdens and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. But how are we supposed to carry one another's burdens if we don't know about one another's burdens? Parents with young kids, um, are you going crazy? Do you need a night out? If so, do you tell people you are really struggling or do you just try to handle it yourself? Right? We can't help you carry your burden if we don't know about your burden. Now, once we know about it, the group has a responsibility to carry it with you, but they can never do that unless you say your need. We have, we have a link on our website, which is uh, bridges.church, bridges.church. I love that we have that domain. Good job to our team who bought that the first day it was on the market. Bridges.church, if you go there, um, front and center on the front page, it says, I need help. If you click the I need help button, it's like sending a flare up into the air. Um, And you can submit a message to say what your need is. We actually have a deacon in charge of getting people help if they need it. But I'll tell you, we put this button up on our website over a year ago. And we've had a few requests for help, but not a bunch. I mean, some, not a lot. Which either means, I think that means two things, um, two choices. As a group, number one, as a group, we don't have very many burdens. That's one thing it could mean. Um, Or the other thing it could mean is we don't do a very good job telling others about our burdens. I have a feeling we have some burdens. We probably just try to handle them on our own, right? We try to be self-sufficient. And the more we do that, the less others can accept us as Christ accepts us, the less they could carry our burdens, okay? Okay, so we need to reveal our suffering to others. That's actually the easiest type of transparency that we'll talk about today. We're just gonna keep increasing in difficulty. Second aspect of our lives that we need to reveal uh, to others in order for them to have the opportunity to accept us as Christ accepts us, shortcomings. We need to tell them about our shortcomings. Uh, Shortcomings are possibly included um, when Paul's saying boast in his weaknesses. That's shortcomings could be a type of boasting and weaknesses. Uh, Paul could have been talking about inadequacies he had when he said he had weaknesses. That's even likely. But even more explicit than 2 Corinthians 12 is 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, where Paul is um, talking about how God uses weak people. God uses those without influence. God uses the foolish and the lowly people in the world to accomplish his purposes. And then referring to himself, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 1, Paul says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence uh, or human wisdom. Like, if you read his resume, it would say, bad speaker. Um, He says, I came to you in weakness, with fear, and much trembling, How do you feel about your ministry, Paul? I'm terrified of it, um, and I'm not a good speaker. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So instead of covering up his shortcomings, he highlights them, like puts them in bold, um, gets the yellow highlighter and colors all over it. He gives like an anti-resume. He's talking himself down instead of talking himself up, right? And that is boasting in your weaknesses. Just wondering, when we're talking about our performance, do we try to touch up our blemishes? Do we try to make ourselves look more competent than we really are? Or are we like, look at my blemishes! Let me circle back around to how much I messed up. Because I'm not sure you got the full picture the first time when we talked about my, my failures. So let's just go through them again. If we lose our job, If we get a poor performance review, do we tell people about it? Or do we try to spin it to make it sound like somebody else's fault? Or, oh, you know, I'm actually happy about the opportunity to get to try something new, finally. I I got out of that uh, situation. 
listen, you don't need to spin it. The group is supposed to accept you like Christ accepts you. He knows how bad you messed up. He knows, he knows you were in way over your head and you shouldn't have taken on that extra responsibility. He knows that you fell flat on your face, put your foot in your mouth, looked ridiculous. He knows about that. He knows people literally laughed at you and called you a fool. He knows all that. And he still accepts you. The group can't accept us like that unless they know us like that unless they know about those shortcomings. Side note to our uh, biblical scholars who want to stand up and say Paul wasn't boasting about his weakness in order to be accepted. I agree. Paul was boasting about his weakness in order to make much of Christ. Absolutely. He's becoming lesser so that Christ can become more. A plus. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Let's just imagine that you didn't try to cover up your shortcomings. But instead, you regularly and confidently talked about your shortcomings. Like somebody points out something you did wrong, and instead of being defensive, you're like, brother, you don't know the half of it. I am far more of a failure than you will ever realize. What if you handled yourself like that in the world? Do you think it would stick out to other people? Do you think they would notice? Of course they would. And then they'd probably ask. They'd be like, why are you like that? Why do you lean into it when somebody calls you a fool? Why do you receive it so well, right? And you can say, because I know that Christ accepts me. And bonus, my church accepts me like Christ accepts me. So when I mess up, which happens, I don't feel inadequate because I don't get my sense of approval or my sense of security from my performance. That's not where it comes from. My sense of approval, my sense of security comes from Christ's acceptance of me. And as an extra, my church's acceptance of me. If you say that, just guessing, other people will probably be like, where is it that you go to church? Okay, third aspect of ourselves that we must reveal in order for the church to accept us like Christ accepts us. Sin. Sin. We must reveal our sin. Uh, James, brother of Jesus, of course, writes, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed, James 5.16. Confess your sins to one another. And we're like, can't I just confess my sins to God? without bringing anybody else into it. Um, and certainly, we need to admit our moral failures to God, of course. Like, that's part of a re repentance that's required, yes. But James emphasizes an additional angle to confession. He says, confess your sins to one another. And Paul actually lives this out. He, he confesses his sins to others. We already talked about Romans 7, where Paul writes that he can't stop sinning but you got to realize that Paul wrote that in a letter to a whole church. It's not like Romans 7 was Paul's private prayer journal um, that we only discovered after Paul died, right? And then we dig it up and we're like, oh, I guess Paul was a big mess. Who knew? It's not what happened. He revealed it to the whole church in Rome. It's like he posted it on his Twitter right? As, as public as he could say it, he said it. He's like, guys, I'm kind of flailing around in my sin here. I can't stop. What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this? Can you imagine somebody putting that on their social media today? What about like a church leader like Paul? Paul did it. Listen, I know it's intimidating to be transparent about our sin, but unless other people really see you to the bottom, they will never have the opportunity to accept you like Christ accepts you. And there is something healing, something needed, something that our souls long for about being seen to the bottom and yet loved to the sky to be truly known and received by another gives us so much confidence and security and joy. It's one of our deepest hopes. 
if we share that level of transparency with others, it really binds us to them. If, on the other hand, what we tend to do, if we put up walls, if we don't let others in, we will not feel connected to them. I mean, think about it. If you don't let, the, if you don't let others in, how could you feel connected to them, right? Like, if you're keeping them out, if you put up a wall, then you will feel isolated, kind of by definition, right? Why do we put up walls? In order to be separated from others. That's, you know, the guy who invented the wall. That's why he did it. But if we do that, like, then we will feel separated. Of course, we will feel alone because we've isolated ourselves. This is the crisis for many of us, right? We cannot stand feeling lonely. But at the same time, we're terrified to let anyone else truly know us. But the fact is, it's one or the other. If we don't let people in, we will be lonely. So if you don't feel connected to this church, for example, which we did our survey, and if you haven't been here the last few weeks, that's about a third of you don't feel connected to this church. If you don't feel connected to this church, part of that failure is on the church, for sure. We've been talking about that. Did we greet you? Did we welcome you? Did we encourage you? Did we include you? Did we remember you, right? Part of your loneliness is because the church has failed, um, and we need to work on that, and I'm sorry, and that's why we're doing this series. But it's possible Part of your loneliness is because of you. Because if you didn't let others in, it doesn't matter how much the others encourage you and appreciate you and affirm you. You will still feel like you don't belong because it's self-isolation. You haven't let anyone else know you. You've got to put yourself out there. You have to. Once you put yourself out there, the the rest of the group is required to receive you, not reject you. And unfortunately, maybe some of you have had a rejection experience here. You put yourself out there, you got burned, and you're like, I'm not doing that again. Oh, it's safer to be lonely. At least I won't be rejected. If I'm never known, I can't be rejected. And you're right, it is safer. We had a, a sermon question come in a couple of weeks ago. This came in anonymously, no idea who sent it in, but it breaks my heart. The person asked, should someone continue seeking community if all they experience is rejection? A uh, person asked, even though living without community leads to lower life expectancy, being ostracized from community must be worse. So the person was like, yeah, loneliness is bad, but it's not as bad as rejection, so how many times should I put myself out there? That was the question, right? Like, give me a number. Doesn't it grieve you to hear someone has had that experience at Bridges? It does me. It bothers me a lot. But to answer the question, in case some of the rest of you have the same strategy, isn't it better to close yourself off so that you won't be rejected? Isn't that better? The answer is no, it is not better. C.S. Lewis said it like this, if you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, um, in other words, if you want to make sure your heart never gets broken, if you want to guarantee you will never get rejected, this is what C.S. Lewis says, quote, you must give your heart to no one not even an animal. Wrap it round uh, carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe. Lock your heart up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable, end quote. He says, if you close yourself off from others to protect yourself, then you will die in that tomb. But if you want to uh, experience the thrill of someone accepting you like Christ accepts you, then you have to let others know you like Christ knows you. He knows about your past. He knows about your suffering. He knows about your shortcomings. 
He knows about your sin. Of course he knows about your sin. He paid for it, right? On the cross, he bore the weight of your sin so that you would be free from it. He sees all your warts and failures. And he says, I'm running toward you. He accepts you. If you want someone else to accept you like he accepts you, then you need to let them in. They need to truly know you, your sufferings, your shortcomings, and your sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how we are accepted in Christ. It is frankly mind-boggling, Lord, and we doubt. We have serious doubts that anybody could accept us like you accept us, Lord. That if anybody truly saw us to the bottom, that they would still want to have anything to do with us, Lord. We doubt that. I pray that you would give us the confidence to speak, confess, reveal who we truly are. And I pray as a church we embrace one another, we welcome one another, that we accept one another as you accept us. We pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
God's grace reaches far. God giving us what we don't deserve. That's worth celebrating. We were dead. God, through Jesus, makes us alive. We were living in darkness. God, through Jesus, grace brings us into light. And we, that is totally worth celebrating. So thank you so much for being with us today. If you're visiting here for the first time, my name is Steve. I, one of the pastors here would love to know that you're here and would connect with you, would love to pray for you if you're visiting, answering any questions that you might have about the life of the church. So I'll stick around for a few moments uh, down here in the front, uh, to my left, to your right. You can find me and would love to connect with you in some way. And anybody here that has a prayer need uh, would want to encourage you to do that. Now, earlier, Pastor Dan referenced a website, bridges.church, and you need to know bridges.church. It'll take you to our larger website, but I also want to give you an even simplified version of that, bridges.info. Each week we come up here, we talk about bridges.info. And so instead of going to bridges.church, I mean, like you can go there, but bridges.info is going to give you the most immediate access to the like next steps that you and I need to take. For giving, giving online, you can give online at bridges.info. You can give securely. If you've never done that before, just click. It'll take you through a couple steps. It's super easy. My wife and I do that whenever we give. We encourage our regular attenders here to tithe and to offer up our offerings through bridges.info. We also have some boxes in the back there on the wall. If you want to just drop in a check or a cash or anything like that, you can put those on those two boxes in the back wall. But bridges.info will take you there. Bridges.info will also let you submit one or more questions or comments or thoughts from Pastor Dan's message today. You can uh, do that going by, uh, to bridges.info. You can do that, and he will do his best to address those questions. We always do a video at the end of each week addressing one or more of the questions that we receive. Uh, and if we don't address those, then we'll just, if we know who sent it, if you put like your email address, we do always follow up in some way because we like to receive these kinds of comments. Bridges.info for that. You can also go to bridges.info for service opportunities and ways to plug in. And I want to tell you about two ways that you can show God's love to the people around you that are at bridges.info. If you go to service opportunities at bridges.info, you can do that right now. You don't even have to be listening to me uh, uh, alone. You can go there and listen to what I'm going to share with you. The first thing, we talked about this last week, family fun night coming out uh, Friday, October the 29th. That is less than two weeks away. Our family ministries team is doing a great job of putting together this event, but we need your help. Friday, October the 29th, from 5.30 to 8.30. No, like we're not there just yet. Going back to Family Fun Night. I want to hold there on that slide, and I'm going to wait until that slide comes back up. There we go. Yeah, hold it there. Thank you very, very much. Let's talk about this. We need people to sign up to decorate your cars. Right now, as of this morning, we have nine people who've signed up. Great. We Nine people to decorate your cars. That's fantastic. We want at least 30 how many? At least 30. We can do more than 30, but we need at least 30. And so you can do that today. You can come up and tell me. When you leave, you can go out to the table that is right out there uh, on the little patio. You'll find there, it gives you a way to text Alba, who's our director of family and children's ministries. And you can text her. It's got her number there. And just say, yes, I'd like to sponsor a car and decorate my car. Uh, you will find other ways that you can plug in by going to bridges.info. But most immediate, we need people to decorate your car because this is a drive through event and it's super easy. You decorate your car, put on a costume, we give candy out to people as they drive through. And last year, whenever we did this, over the course of three hours, we just had a steady stream of traffic. That is such a practical way to show God's love in a practical way to people as they drive through. It puts a smile on their faces. It shows that we care about our community and people bring their kids and they drive through and they linger and they go from car to car and we make sure that we're socially distanced and we do all that kind of stuff. But I promise if you participate and you decorate your car, you're going to have a lot of fun. We do also need help with directing traffic. We need everybody to donate candy. Our thing that we always say is this, we want 100% involvement from the church in one way or another. You're like, I can't decorate a car uh, or I can't 
you know, decorate, uh, or excuse me, donate candy, but there are other ways to participate. Everybody can do something. You can pray for the event. You can be here at that event. You can also invite. We want everybody inviting. And there are postcards that are out there. If you go on out there and you say, hey, I want to invite others, you'll find postcards there. You go to bridges.info. It will take you to ways that you can tell others about it. So that is coming up, October the 29th. I would love if by the time I, I hop in my car to go home today to find out, hey, Steve, we have 30 people who've signed up to, uh, to decorate their cars. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. But even if we don't get all the way there, we do one in it, and we need to get there over the next uh, couple days. So please, please, please don't wait. So that's one thing you need to know. Another way to show love to your neighbor is by signing up for our Feed My Starving Children event that is coming up on November 19th and 20th. Sign-ups are already ongoing. Go to bridges.info, service opportunities. You're going to find out about this great event where we, over two-hour shifts, pack food that goes to children and families in malnourished countries. It's a fantastic, super fun time. We put you in different groups of 10. Maybe you already have a corporate group of 10. You want to be, bring people from work. They don't have to be Christ followers. They don't have to be connected to any church. Bring your neighbors, okay? People who, um, of all ages, honestly, can participate. So to go to bridges.info and I promise two things are going to happen. If you do family fun night, if you do feed my starving children, one thing is you are going to be showing God's love in a very, very tangible way. You're going to be meeting a practical need. I guarantee you that. But the second thing that's going to happen, and I feel very, very strongly about this, if you do these events, you are going to feel better connected to your church. You are. You're going to feel connected because you're going to be serving elbow to elbow right alongside people who are just like you, and we've talked about how to get plugged in. This is the way to do it. Go to bridges.info, sign up for Family Fun Night to help in some way. Go to bridges.info, sign up for Feed My Starving Children. Let's do this together and let's show God's love to our community. Now, before I close us here with a word of prayer, some of you are already aware of this, but I need to point it out. Did you know that your lead pastor just had a special birthday on Friday? Did you all know this? He didn't want me to talk about this, but what he did say is that he said, Steve, uh, my number one birthday wish is that people would sign up to decorate their cars at family fun night. <laughs> he didn't overtly say it, but sometimes, like, I think we've worked together long enough, Dan, that I, I can look into your eyes, and I, I could tell that that's really, really what he wanted. If you want something also on top of decorating your car or signing up for these things, uh, this man, you know, probably would love to take his wife out for a night out or something like that. So he's not asking for stuff. But if you're like, like how do I show love to Pastor Dan uh, celebrating this uh, milestone birthday? Like you're 22, 23. How old are you now? I don't, I don't even know. It was a milestone birthday and it was a special time. Uh, you can get him a gift card or whatever. That, that's, that's for me. That's not him asking. But he does also, as our lead pastor, want you to sign up to help bridges.info. Thank you so much for being here. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we just sang that literally, Lord. We talk about all that you've done for us. What you've done is you sent your son Jesus to the earth to live among us. The word becoming flesh. The word who was from the beginning. The word living, speaking your love to people, going around, doing good, pointing us back to you, paying the penalty for our sins on the cross, not because we deserved it, but because of your extravagant love, rising again, giving us the hope of eternal life and of one day having a relationship with you. Thank you for making that possible. I do pray for these upcoming events, pray that they would honor you. These, these events are not about us. They're not about our, our name, our reputation, as much as they are tangible ways that we can show love to our community. And I pray that they would bring great joy to people as they participate. But again, not, not because of us, but because you're a God who delights in your children, loving others as you love us. Thank you for accepting us. As you accept us, may we accept others. As you 
extend hospitality to us. May we extend hospitality to others around us this week. May we apply this message today, being vulnerable and open about all of our shortcomings and the suffering and the sin in our lives, but also listening and being an accepting, welcoming person uh, as others bring up those needs as well. Father, we love you. Be glorified in all that we say and do this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.